<clears throat> hey Alex. Hey Nick. Hi Anne. I thought you were going to come for dinner. Hey Angie. Oh, Robin! Oh my god! Uh, Angie, I need to talk to you a little bit later on, but it's good that you're on. So, um, everyone, Angie's just come on, so just track her down. Um, I thought I'd do a little uh, video. Hi, Grace. Um, so, I've been constructing my teaching material for, um, for Dallas, which is the year-long class in... Uh, gothic scripts and you know I'm, I, I I did a year of paleographical study um, at Birkbeck studying English paleography from 600 to 1600 and I'd forgotten how much I love paleography so the research that I've been doing uh, is principally for the lecture rather than the class because it's 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 really quite complicated and um, I thought it would be nice to to share with you some of the uh, information that I've um, been reminding myself about. So we start off, um, the class is next week, Thursday evening, there's a lecture in Dallas. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday is the class studying textualis quadrata and textualis semi quadrata. Um, I then leave Dallas and go to Toronto and teach copper plate script. I give a lecture as well in the evening. Um, then I'm going to be in New York for the National Stationery Show on the 21st and 22nd. Um, my time's really tied up, unfortunately. And then I go to Calgary to teach copper plate script and um, a two day class in copper plate script and a class, a two day class in flourishing. Uh, but there's a lot that's happening. I'm going to China, to, be, to Taiwan and China in July and um, back to Dallas, teaching at Iampeth in September, in, in August, sorry, and then Dallas, and then August I'm teaching in India, so all the material on India is on Eventbrite, um, there's tons of classes, uh, so if you have any friends in India, please direct them to that, and then um, I'm back in Dallas in November, um, and December, I'm thinking of going to Asia to teach again because I love the food in Asia. <laughs> so, uh, enough waffling. Um, textualis quadrata. So, I know, um, I know Instagram is supposed to allow you to, to, uh, to do the work, to do the, the live landscape but for some strange reason I still haven't been able to get it to work on my phone all right so I'm using a speedball c3 nib c2 nib so for those of you just joining us we're looking at textualis quadrata most people call this gothic um, it belongs to the gothic script family but there are seven major gothic scripts book hands and a myriad of documentary um gothic uh documentary hands for things like charters and deeds cartularies incunabule lots and lots of different kinds of of, of, of applications um so i wanted to look at this this basic script so this basic script is called Textualis quadrata. Some people refer it uh, refer to it as textura quadrata. Um, it's also known as textus quadrata. The x height. So I'm just going to do a nib ladder. This is my baseline here. The x height is four nib widths. I'm just going to zoom in there. 
So I'm using a piece of acetate behind the, the sheet of paper. So uh, textualis quadrata is uh, generally done anywhere between four to six nib widths. So it can be done, it can actually be done at three and a half. Uh, generally, it's not done up to six. It's usually between three and a half to five and a half. I don't mind doing it at six. Some uh, For display textualis, you can have it done at eight to 10 to 12 nib widths for the, uh, for the minimum letters. So the basis of textualis quadrata is this. This is a quadrant. So we have a quadrant, we have a downstroke, and we have a, sorry about that, and we have a lozenge. So let's just start over. Where are we at? So we have a quadrant, which is 45 degrees. There we go, a lozenge and a downstroke. So if we run a line through the vertical and through the horizontal, the quadrant can be bisected both vertically and horizontally. The lozenge can only really be bisected uh, horizontally. But if you look at the quadrant, you can see that when you move from here to there, this point sits above that point. So your quadrant is, is the, the nib is at 45 degrees. So your quadrant is based on the relationship of these two things. Now, the lozenge, now I, I, I don't call this a diamond because uh, this, is also called a diamond because we find this we find this angle used in uh, arabic calligraphy um so I, I tend to pre prefer to call it a, refer to it as a quadrant because of the uh the the name of the script which is textualis quadrata now the difference between the quadrant and the lozenge is the quadrant moves diagonally down at 45 degrees and the lozenge, so notice the angle at the start here, is the angle is 45 degrees for both of them. But the lozenge moves diagonally across. So the quadrant moves down at 45 and the lozenge moves across at 60 degrees. Uh, they work on a fairly um, interesting uh, pattern by... Just going to get a, a larger tool by allowing the um, the shapes to interact with each other. So, for instance, I'm just using a, a Zig Calligraphy One marker. That's your quadrant, and this is your lozenge. Now, the lozenge is a third longer, roughly, than the quadrant, for a number of reasons. When you're writing textualis quadrata. If you are writing an I, so we lift up, we go into the middle, and we come straight down, and then we go back into the middle, and we come down. So what this does is it creates these shoulders. So quadrata uses these shoulders, um, and the reason why the quadrants have to be different from the lozenges is if you have two quadrants and you're trying to write an N, you have no idea if you've just written an A or an N. So by making the quadrant shorter than the lozenge, when the shapes come back together, you have that much space inside it. Now, the width inside here is the width of your tool 
uh, parallel to the baseline. So that's, that's how I generally space the internal spacing inside my Textualis Quadrata. Um, I also look at I'm also very conscious of what kind of textualis I'm doing. So I will place the corner of the nib on the corner and move across and down. And so this is this is a really uh, a, 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 this is a a, a, a formata script. It's a really formal high book hand. So it takes a lot of time to do it. It's not something that's done quickly. And this is this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this little uh, this little live for you guys. Because I wanted to show you some of the variations that you get. So Textualis Quadrata gives us quadrant, downstroke, quadrant, lozenge, corner, lozenge, downstroke, quadrant. And this is where we start to, to really think about the structure of the script. Now, from a paleographical point of view, um, there are, there's a lot of confusion historically with manuscript historians about the nomenclature of these scripts. So some people call certain things um, other things. <laughs> Um, and in rereading my, my old notes from my paleography studies, I, I, I had forgotten the, the confusion that the, the Gothic scripts um, can, can elicit. So we have, in some instances, this is called the formatahan. You also have a semi-quadrata, which goes one and stop, two and stop, and three and stop. Notice I didn't lift the pen, I just stopped. So I'm using a, a calligraphy, a zig calligraphy marker, zig, a calligraphy one marker. So in the first one, we see these pronounced shoulders. In the second one, there aren't any pronounced shoulders. They're just sharp angles. So by going, and this is where the counting really helps, and one and two, and three. Notice I didn't go one and change my hand and change my hand again. I'm keeping the angle. Or you can go and one and two and three and four. Or you can go and one and two and three and four. So obviously I'm looking at across this spectrum of cur uh, curvature and by stopping and waiting and stopping and waiting, you get much sharper angles. So this is how you control the degree of, of, of curvature on the shoulders. Now, this is, the, this is the simplest aspect of the script. The script starts to get considerably more complicated once you start looking at the other letters. So obviously, the two letters you generally look at are I and O. So we can have an O joining. So this is, this is a little trick I developed in, uh, for teaching textualis. Uh, if you're writing a letter O, it's very difficult to figure out where to start the first stroke. So what I tend to do is one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. What I tend to do is this. So I go touch. So I call this the little trick. <laughs> little trick. And then that tells you where to put the tool. So you're going there to there, there to there to there. And in this form of textualis quadrata, what you're aiming for is you're aiming for the shoulders on the top and the bottom but you're aiming for a tangential touch just here, rather than an overlap. Now, let's look at some variants. So some of the variants are one, two, three, and middle, four, five, six, 
five. So this should be a little bit over there. And what you end up with is a fair deal of, there's a little triangular overlap there and another triangular overlap here. The internal space is narrower. The letter is darker. Um, and, and this is where you have to start to become really conscious of what kind of textualis you're doing. Are you overlapping the stems? Of course, you also have this kind of textualis, which uses lines to join the letters. You have a straighter form of textualis, a slightly more curvaceous form of textualis, which curves... The, uh, the the lozenges and of course you have a greater degree of curvature so you could have uh, let's look at the eye so we have one two three four five six so we see a little bit of curve here a little curve here a little curve here and of course because the lozenge is longer you have more curve on that that slightly longer stroke um, and of course it starts to get more complicated now you do have northern textualists and southern textualists um, which compl complicate things even further and there is also a form of textualist which uses a header and a footer and a minimum curve And some paleographers call this semi quadrata. Of course, some call this semi quadrata. <laughs> so it's a really wonderful mind feel, um, and I think it's just about understanding how the how the scripts vary, but but more importantly, what the tool is actually doing to produce the shape. Now, I'm just going to zoom zoom back in because I'm going to use some ink. Uh, there's a reason I want to use ink, and that is you can't really get this shape with a marker. So if we're doing a an ascender, so let's go for six. One, two, three, four, five. That's a little bit sloppy. Sorry about that. Let's just do that over. Uh, where are we at? One, and we'll do four. One, two, three, four, five, and what you're going to do is you're going to turn the tool and you're just going to pull some ink out of the stem which is flooded with ink already and so it creates a really beautiful hackle now uh, or, or a forking as they're called um, yeah okay no jokes on that so these are hackles as well they're usually done in groups of threes the fork the forking that we find at the tops of the letters. Um, see if I can do this over here. It's basically just, I've just turned the tool completely so that you can see what will happen. So that just pulls the ink just out and that gives you, it just gives you that lovely little V-like structure just there, which complements the angular shoulder at the bottom. Now, there are, because Textualis Quadrata was written with a, a quill, the length of the tines on the quill can also affect the way in which the letter is formed. You can have a little bit of entasis or wasting so we have a little pressure and release and pressure. And that gives a, 
gives a real sort of sexiness to the letter because the letter sort of does this and it does this and so it draws your eye in which is a really 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 beautiful really sort of um yes it's a really beautiful extension of course you know you have earlier pre-gothic or proto-gothic scripts which use a slightly different um kind of serif so we have one two three and we have this and you can clearly see the connection between this serif and this serif um Now, there are tons and tons and tons and tons of variations in the, in the Gothic family. And the reason why I wanted to sort of talk about this today is, is really to just sort of point out to you that, that there's a lot, to, a lot to consider. Now, I know some people do a really sort of constructed Gothic script. Uh, it's a, a speedball C2 nib. So they're quite flexible. I mean, they can do that, which is a, a big difference in the amount of curvature. Um, so some people do this. And let's just do that again. Once they've done that, they go back in and they curve some of these and add a little bit more weight to these. Now, as you can see, this, this is a very different letter. This is not a written letter. So this isn't Gothic, this is Textualis Quadrata, which is one of the scripts used in the Gothic period. It's the basis of the Gothic family, family of scripts. So the, 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 this live is primarily to help you get away from the use of that word Gothic to just describe one script because it describes a whole family of scripts. Um, this is not a written letter. What does that mean? So Tom Kemp, who's a really gifted calligrapher, um, who's a really gifted lettering artist because he doesn't like to be called a calligrapher. Uh, so look him up. He does some brilliant pottery as well. Uh, Tom came up with this really amazing description of what is written and what is lettered. So we have something called ductus. So ductus is the stroke number and order. So here we see the O has one, two, three, four strokes. And the order is one and two and three and four. So if you write the letter in real time, so it's not too slow, relative to the script that is, and you are writing the strokes in the order that they are written in, and you are constructing the letter in as many as, so four, or fewer than four strokes, you're writing it. This O had four strokes initially, and it then had another four strokes added to it. So this is, this is not a written letter, it is a lettered construct. So it's more like something we do in a formal script, a formal script we call a versal. So a versal can have a central line around which you build two additional lines. And so the shape has Every, every line then has three additional lines to build it up. So this is a versal. It's a, a built-up or a constructed, letter, a constructed shape. Um, oh, thanks, Chiara. Um, so it, it's really important that you understand what you're doing, but it's, it's more important that you understand what you're calling what you're doing. Um, oh, let's just get this out of there. So we can have a, there you go. So there's the whole page. So I hope that little explanation on um, sort of script types and, oh, uh, and script families is really important. So, you know, again, it, it, it's the same sort of thing 
for English Round Hand. So we have a really amazing uh, array of scripts in the, the English Round Hand. Yes, I mean, that is a problem, you know. When, when I used to do wedding stationery, people used to call me up and say, can you write in this font? And I'd say, I'm, I'm not a computer, so I, I can't write in a font. Pick a script and we'll, we'll deal with it. <laughs> um, I think it's really important that, uh, that, that, that students get a, a, a better understanding of the terminology. Um, and, and this is a real issue for things like... Um, for people doing pointed pen work, a lot of people doing pointed pen work struggle with what is engrossing, what is engravers, uh, what is copper plate, what is English round hand. Of course, English round hand varies considerably across a 300 year period. So when you talk about English round hand, which period are you talking about? And the scripts in the English round hand, the, the shapes of the letters in English round hand vary across a 25 year period. So within every century, you have four categories, but you also have variations uh, temporally across time and geographically across geographical locations, uh, which affects the angle and the axis of the script. And with each script family that you're looking at, understanding which script you're actually writing helps you to get a better grasp of how to produce that script. One of the biggest problems we have with, with with Instagram is people see a letter, a pretty letter, and they add it to the family that they're working with. There are families, there are groups of letters. So we have basic letters, I N M U V W. Of course, with copper plate script, we have A, M, N, V, and W to start with. If your A and M and N and V and W don't look like each other, chances are they don't belong to the same script or the same family which makes writing the alphabet, writing a, a consistent um, group of letters, much more problematic. And if you're starting off, if, if you're at the beginning of your journey and you don't have a good exemplar, you will run into lots of problems um, because the shapes are not helping you to remember um, and to reinforce each other. Um, so just like the textualist situation, so again, remember, Gothic script is the name of the family group. And within that family group, we have textualis quadrata, textualis semi-quadrata, textualis persiscus, uh, batard, fractur, schwabacher, rotunda. And those are the main sort of high book hands. So we find a lot of the um, missiles and... Uh, large Bibles and graduals done in this in, in these higher book hands. And then we have documentary hands, which are used for charters and um, and deeds. Um, and then you have gloss text, which is really tiny text written in the margin of the book hands, which is a whole different set of hands. Um, so there's there's a lot to, to look into. I, I, I hope this isn't also scaring you to do some research. Um, but once you start getting into the research, it's it's really quite fascinating. You know, we, what you see on Instagram is not even a snowflake on the top of the tip of the iceberg of lettering. So I hope that you know you you, you sort of get a, a much better interest in 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 in, um, in wanting to do some historical research. And it's not as daunting as you think. There's tons of sites um, that have lots of manuscripts. Lots of us live in, in uh, cities where, the, uh, where there are libraries. If you live in London, the British Library has an amazing manuscripts room. Um, you can access the V&A. Um, but, you know, just, just do a little bit of research. All right, I'm going to go and get back to my notes. And um, I hope you have a, a great, great, great day ahead. Just remember, there's tons of classes coming up all over the world. If you're not sure if I'm coming to somewhere close to you, just send me a quick email. Um, I think the email address is on the site above. All right. <laughs> yes. Well, I've just written a book and I think I need a break from writing books because it was, you know, there was a lot to do. It was a lot, a big, big learning curve. Um, but thank you very much for that vote of confidence. Um, 
So uh, I, I know a lot of you are, are a little bit afraid of uh, broad edge nibs. Um, there are three videos on my, um, my YouTube called Posture, Position and Placement. Please look at these videos first. These videos give you a real understanding of how to sit, why to sit correctly. Um, and if you have any kind of back pain or your hand hurts or your neck hurts, chances are you're not sitting in the correct position. And this could dramatically help you. It could dramatically change the way that your body interacts with the, the surface. You know, if you are suffering when you're doing calligraphy, you're doing something wrong. So you should never be in pain when you sit down to write. Or if you've been writing for an extended period, you should never be in pain. If you are in pain, there is something wrong with the way you are sitting. So check out the videos on YouTube, the posture, position and placement. I have some amendments to do to them and some additions for additional videos um, to help you with broad edge scripts. And if you need to know anything else, just drop me a quick message. I will be in New York on the 22nd and the 21st and 22nd of this month, but only really to go to the, uh, the stationery show. Um, I have not planned a trip to come and teach in New York as yet. I just need to look at my diary once I get back from teaching in, uh, in May. So thanks very much for your time. Hey, Rohan.